last session it was on happiness. Today it's on the fact that Abdu Baha saw only the good in all people. The quality of only seeing the good in people may be the most important message we can take from Abdu Baha. Over and over again he emphasized this point that he only saw good in every person he met and he ignored all the bad in people. In both cases this is something that he did. And this is such an essential quality and one that he emphasized so much himself that I found I had to list it as the second quality immediately after happiness. We're told in the Baha'i teachings that God cannot be known completely. We can't know God's essence. But what we can know of God are his qualities or his attributes. So we think, what are the qualities and attributes of God? It's kind of like saying, what are the qualities and attributes of the sun? The sun has the quality of heat. It has the quality of light or electromagnetic waves and so on. This is not the complete sun. This is just some of the qualities that we know of the sun. And in the same way, we know of God by knowing of various attributes. Attributes like love, compassion, generosity, forgiveness, kindness, wisdom. These are all attributes of God. And we have to learn to think of God as a bundle of attributes. The only way we are told we can know these attributes is by seeing them in other people. If we didn't know a generous person, how would we know that God is generous? If we didn't know a kind person, how would we be able to understand that God is kind? So I want you to think of these things as God themselves. Think of kindness as God. Think of compassion as God. Think of these things are just a little part of God. Now here's the trick. Every time you see a person, I want you to look for a good quality in them. I want you to look for love. Look for compassion. Look for generosity. Look for kindness. Look very hard and see if you can find a good quality. And when you see that good quality in that person, you just saw God. Abdu Baha realized that every single person is an unopened letter from God. Every single person he came across, he looked hard, and when he found God, he loved them. And he ignored every other part of the person. Because to him, that didn't exist. It actually doesn't exist. The bad qualities in a person have no existence. If I took a glass of water, and it had a tiny bit of water here at the bottom was full of emptiness, I would not hand it to someone and say, here's a glass of 90% emptiness. Here's a glass of 90% empty. I would say, here's a glass of a little bit of water. Adabaha looked at every person as a glass of water, partially full, partially empty, and he concentrated on the water. When you look at the stars at night, and you see them in a constellation, you just look at the stars. Do you look at the black around the stars? No, you say there's stars in the sky. This is what Adabaha did with every single person. Now, Adabaha said that if somebody has 10 good qualities and one bad quality, to look at the 10 good qualities and ignore the bad one. He said if someone has 10 bad qualities and one good quality, and I think I know who he was talking about, but I'm not going <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, just, just the initials. But, but anyway, he said if, if they have 10 bad qualities and one good, ignore the 10 bad ones and just look at the one good. Now the interesting thing is, is that once you start looking for the God in people, which is the good qualities, once you start looking, you start to see them a lot more. Now, the interesting thing is, then suddenly you start seeing God everywhere. Every time you have lunch with somebody and they're sitting across from the table, you are seeing God because you're looking for the God in them. Every single person reflects God to a certain extent. Now all of us have the power to reflect God a little bit. Some reflect God a little more than others. And Adabaha looked hard until he could find the God in them. And then he said a very interesting thing. He said, this is the only way you can love people. And finally, the penny dropped. I didn't get that memo for most of my life, that you can't love people when you look at their faults.
Believe me, I've tried. You cannot do it. You can't love people if you see their bad qualities. And, and this always confused me as a Baha'i because we're told to love everybody. We're told to love our enemies. And I said, how can you love these people? The point is you don't love their bad qualities. They don't exist. Darkness doesn't exist. Rather, you look for the good in them and then you can love them. And Adi Baha said, as long as you see a good quality in a person, you're seeing God, how can you not love it? It's God. And Adi Baha said that there are four kinds of love, the love of God for man and man for God and God for God. And he said, there's this one kind of love, the love of man for man, this particular kind of love that's very difficult. And he says that this love can only be attained by looking for the good and only the good in other people. He says this love, the fourth kind of love, is attained through the knowledge of God so that men see the divine love reflected in the heart. Each sees in the other the beauty of God reflected in the soul. This is the key to love, is to look for the good quality in the person. So this is how Abdu Baha did it. He constantly found a way to make people's darkness disappear by not focusing on their faults, but by focusing on the good qualities that he could build. How many of you have read the story of Hudson Maxim, famous inventor? In fact, he and his family were in the war business, and they were the greatest builders of weapons the world had ever seen. Thomas Edison, who was no slouch when it came to inventions, said that Hudson Maxim was, quote, the most versatile man in America in terms of what he was able to invent. In fact, his brother had invented the machine gun in 1883, which revolutionized warfare, enabled the British to conquer large portions of Africa. In fact, at one time, they mowed down 1,500 Matabi warriors with just four Englishmen with this invention that his brother had made. And the younger brother, Hudson Maxim, invented war explosives, which completely revolutionized modern warfare, and he was a very wealthy man. And the New York Times wrote of Hudson Maxim, and I quote, he has made enough high explosives to blow all the navies in the world out of the water and start them well on the way towards the moon. And so this man, Hudson Maxim, heard that somebody from Persia was in America talking about peace. And so he decided he was going to go and put this man in his place. And so he had a meeting with Abdu Baha. And I can't tell you the whole thing, but it's just so interesting. For example, he said, I understand you are a messenger of peace to this country. What is your opinion of modern war? And Abdu Baha said, everything that prevents war is good. Isn't that good? He didn't say anything bad about war. He just said something good about anything that prevents war. So the, the man says, do you consider the next great national war necessary? Adabaha said, why not try peace for a while? If we find war is better, it will be not be difficult to go back to fighting again. <laughs> so the man said, he said, but less men are killed in war in a year than are killed by our industries in preventable accidents. Adabaha said, war is the most preventable accident. <laughs> it's quite clear that Adabaha was just boom, 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 hitting him with, and he, he wasn't getting the point. He was not getting the point. And he made all these ridiculous arguments. War is part of human nature. Conflict is an ingredient of healthy social evolution. Anyway, in the end, Adabaha just said a few words, and I want to read you what he said. He said this, the discovery of high explosives, perfecting of death-dealing weapons of war, the science of military attack. All this is... Now what do you think Adabaha was going to say there? All this is what? He says, the discovery of high explosives, perfecting of death-dealing weapons of war, the science of military attack, all of this is what? Futile, maybe? I don't know. He said, let me tell you what he said. All this is a wonderful manifestation of human intelligence. Isn't that interesting? And he's right, isn't it? It's a wonderful manifestation of human intelligence. He even sees the good in things, not just people. He says it's a wonderful manifestation. And he goes on to say, but 
It is in the wrong direction. You are a celebrated inventor and scientific expert whose energies and faculties are employed in the production of means for human destruction. Your name has become famous in the science of war. Now you have the opportunity of becoming doubly famous. You must practice the science of peace. You must expend your energies and intelligence in a contrary direction. You must discover the means of peace. Invent guns of love, which shall shake the foundations of humanity. The guns you are building cause the death of man. You must build guns which will cause life to humanity. Henceforth, your life and energy should be given to this blessed purpose. You must work and experiment along this line. This work and accomplishment will be more wonderful than all you have done heretofore. Then it will be said by the people of the world, this Mr. Maxim, inventor of the guns of war, discoverer of high explosives, military scientist, who has also discovered and invented means for increasing the life and love of man, who has put an end to the strife of nations and uprooted the tree of war. This will be the most wonderful accomplishment of any human being. Your name will glow with mention throughout the history of ages and ages. Then will your life become pregnant and productive with great results. Consider this. The inventor of high explosives has discovered the means of universal peace. No man in history will equal you in fame and greatness. You will be doubly renowned. God will be pleased with you. And from every standpoint of estimation, you will be a perfect man. You see, sometimes you don't focus on the problem. This is the prime quality that Autobaha had. Every single person has some good qualities. There's not a single person that doesn't. I mean, there may be one or two, but I'm not going <laughs> to. No, I'm kidding. There's not anybody that does not have good qualities. But also, every person has bad qualities, with the exception of Adi Baha. Therefore, this is a challenge for you, because their bad qualities can be right in your face. Baha'u'llah says there's something you can do. He says, whenever you see the bad quality in a person, think of your own. Magnify not the faults of others, that thine own faults may not appear great. Did you notice he said that? I thought that was very interesting. He's, in other words, he's saying that any time you magnify the fault of another person, it makes your faults appear great. It's kind of some kind of spiritual law. It's like the old saying, they say, any time you point a finger at somebody, there's three fingers pointing back at you. And I find this interesting because Abdu Baha, he said, that if the believers complain with one another, he will fly away. And I remember thinking about the hand of the cause. Mr. Fazy, he was such a gentle soul, but he could not stand to hear backbiting. But at the same time, he could not bear to tell somebody who was backbiting that they were, because that would also be drawing attention to their fault. So this was a real dilemma for him. So he adopted the habit that any time he heard backbiting, he would go to the bathroom. He would say, I have to go to the bathroom. And this became his habit. And many of the believers said they were surprised how often Mr. Fazy uh, had to go to the bathroom. And sometimes he would come back from the bathroom and say, I have to go back again, and, you know, and so on. And gradually, I think they got the idea. I think they got the idea. Abdu Baha, clearly did not want to hear any backbiting. But much more than that, I want to make this very clear, backbiting, we don't, I, I think when we talk about backbiting, we do ourselves a disservice because we don't realize the full extent of what Adi Baha and Baha'u'llah want of us. For example, some people think that backbiting is saying something about the person that's wrong. But if it's true, then we're allowed to say it. Okay, we think, well, if it's the true fault of the person. But in fact, that's a completely different thing. When you say something that's false, that's called calumny. And that's also prohibited by Baha'u'llah in the Akdas. In fact, in the Akdas, Baha'u'llah prohibits four things in one sentence. The first four things, they are murder and adultery and backbiting and calumny. And just those four. All the other things are prohibited later on. But in one sentence, he groups together murder with calumny and backbiting. 
And so, first of all, it makes no difference if it's true. It makes absolutely no difference if it's true. But in addition to that, Baha'u'llah says, breathe not the sins of others so long as thou art thyself a sinner. Now, backbiting is something that we speak. It comes in this direction out. But breathing is an inner taking. Okay, breathing is something you take in. He says, don't even breathe the sins of others. Don't even take them in, let alone to let them out. This is a higher form of not backbiting because you're not even seeing the bad quality, so how could you possibly backbite? This is why Mr. Fazy had to leave the room. And there's some people that you need to look hard. You need to look past a whole lot of things in order to fulfill this requirement. But Adabaha did it to every single person he met. Every single person he met, he said, I'm going to only see the good in that person. And when he did, he was seeing God. Consequently, Adabaha spent his day with God. Not just in his morning prayers or his evening prayers was he with God. He was with God every moment of his life because he was only focusing on good qualities which are God. And you yourself are missing God most of your life if you're looking at the bad qualities in persons. And you will suddenly find God everywhere. They will see in you, they will see in you that you love them. And they will see in you that you see the good in them. And they will see in you that you're happy. How many of you are happier now than you were when you heard that Adi Bahas was happiness? How many of you are happy now? And how many of you feel that you can go out and be happy with people? Now combine it with this teaching. Now we come to the third quality of Abdu Baha that we want to talk about. I'm going to tell you a little story and then we'll figure out what this third quality is. Okay. It's hard to imagine anyone who did more harm to Baha'u'llah and the Babis than the Shah of Iran, Nazaruddin Shah. He was the one who ordered the execution of the Bab. He was the one who was responsible for the execution of some 20,000 Babis. He was the one who had Baha'u'llah imprisoned in the Sia Shah, setting forth an entire life of imprisonment and banishment. And they say he was perhaps only equaled by his son, the prince, who was Zilla Sultan. Zilla Sultan means what shadow of the king, isn't that right? It means it's the prince. And this prince worked hand in hand with his father in the persecution of the Babis and the Baha'is. In fact, the two greatest martyrs in the Baha'i faith, the beloved of martyrs and the king of martyrs, were personally ordered executed by Zilla Sultan. And he put hundreds of Baha'is and Babis to horrifying deaths. And you know that ultimately his father, the Shah of Iran, lost power and the family went into exile. Now I want to ask you about a remarkable coincidence and what are the odds of this coincidence taking place? Abdu Baha ends up a prisoner and an exile for almost his entire life until his late 60s because of the Shah and this son, the prince. And finally, in his late 60s, he gets out of prison. It takes him a year just to gain his health in Egypt. And then finally, for the first time, gets on a boat, sails to the south of France to Marseille, immediately travels up to Geneva without stopping, and then stays in a hotel called La Paix, which means peace. And he says, for the first time in my life, I experienced peace, which has is, is got to be true, that for the first time in his life, he experienced peace. And this is the first place he stops in the West in Geneva, and then goes to the West and stays in Tonale Bay, just on the border of France in Geneva. So what are the odds that this first place Adi Baha stops in the West, that the prince, Zilzatan, happens to be in exile in Geneva, of all spots on the planet, and Adabaha gets out and he's right there. What are the odds of that? I'm thinking it's amazing. But what are the odds that on the day that Adabaha is walking the streets of Tonole Bay in France, that he's not even in Geneva, he's actually in Tonole Bay himself? That these two would meet the very first place Adabaha visit? Don't you think that's kind of unusual? And so Zilla Sotan is walking and he sees a man in Persian clothing. Now, that's got to be pretty unusual in 1912 in France. 
So naturally he says to somebody, he says, who is that Persian man? What are the odds that the person he asks is a Baha'i? <laughs> Hippolyte Dreyfus. And Hippolyte Dreyfus says, it is Abdu Baha. And he knows who Abdu Baha is and he knows what he did to Abdu Baha. And so he says, will you take me to him? And so Hippolyte writes in a letter to Juliet Thompson about this. He says, if you could have seen the brute, Juliet, mumbling out his miserable excuses. And I'm thinking about this scene. This man who Abdu Baha saw at the age of nine, his father with hundred pound chains suffering. This man who saw the death and the execution of thousands of his followers, who had to witness the death of his own brother before his eyes and beg his father to save his life and couldn't do it, who remained a prisoner his entire life. And now this man comes to him on his first day and he's trying to experience peace and he's making miserable excuses. And I'm thinking, what's going to happen? And Hippolyte continues, he said, the master took him in his arms and said, all those things are in the past. Never think of them again. Then he invited Zilla Sultan and two sons to spend a day with him. And as I read that, I thought, Adabaha's forgiveness had no bounds. No bounds. Who possibly has ever done anything to me as much as this man did to Adabaha and his father and the Baha'is? Nobody. And Adabaha took him in his arms and said, all those things are in the past, never think about them. And then wanted to spend the day with him. And I realized this quality of forgiveness of Abdu Baha, it is an amazing quality. His forgiveness had no bounds. And it made me think over and over again about the quality of forgiveness that Abdu Baha had. But I, it only struck a chord in me later on when I found out that Abdu Baha himself told the Baha'is they must learn to forgive that we must learn to forgive everyone. And I think it is no accident in history that this meeting took place. This meeting, this unbelievably remarkable coincidence, before we saw Abdu Baha in any other sphere of activity in the West, this is the first incident that God gave us to see for a thousand years. This will go down as the greatest historical lesson or legend in Baha'i history that the son of the Shah came to Adi Baha and he hugged him and said those things are in the past. And so as I thought about it, I realized that the quality of forgiveness is an essential spiritual quality, not just one of the many hundred or so that I could pick, but also that it's a very hard virtue. It's an extremely difficult virtue. And so I felt it's important to mention this, all of the other six that we're going to talk about, the two that we know already, happiness, it's not so hard to smile. Seeing the good in people, you try a little bit, it's not so hard. And the others, the other three, they're not so hard. But forgiveness, that's a hard one. You can easily assess your own spiritual maturity anytime you are unhappy or you don't forgive. Because anytime you're unhappy, all you have to think about is, what am I attached to? that's making me unhappy? Is it material things or comfort or something? In other words, unhappiness is a sure way to look at yourself and say, well, what am I attached to that's making me unhappy? Baha'u'llah says there's only one time you're allowed to be unhappy. That's when you're far from God. And there's only one time when you're allowed to be happy, and that's when you're close to God. So anytime you have any form of unhappiness, it's a form of spiritual diagnosis. It's the same with forgiveness. Anytime you don't forgive someone, just say, let me think about that reason. Why don't I forgive them? What is it that I'm attached to? It's not about them. It's about me and my attachment. And suddenly you realize that this quality that Adabaha is talking about, this quality is the pathway to love. Let's, let's just analyze the story. Let's just think about this, first of all. The prince, Zilla Satan, he did a wrong thing. Would you agree? Would you think killing 20,000 babis and, you know, it's not, it's, it's wrong. Okay, so we don't just forgive people that are good. You have to forgive the bad people. So he did the wrong thing. Secondly, he did not acknowledge that he did the wrong thing or apologize. Did you notice that? 
in the story. He did not apologize. Some, some of us like to, if the person apologizes or admits they did it, they say, okay, now I forgive you. You know, well, we'll forgive them as long as they will do that, okay? It, you think it helps, okay. But this didn't happen in this case. Furthermore, Abdu'l-Bahá did not seem to feel the need to tell him all the things that he did and that why he felt and why he suffered. A lot of us, we want to go to a person and we want to share with them, I want you to feel what I felt. I want you to understand how much you hurt me. I want you to do all that. And then we do that and then we forgive them. We feel that it's necessary for us first. Adabaha didn't do that. In fact, quite the contrary. He said, don't even think about those things. He didn't even want him to think about those things. Furthermore, and this is the hardest. Adabaha then said he would spend the day with him and his sons. And this is the hardest of the four. I mean, I, you know, I can think of maybe going, okay, I forgive you now, get out of my face. You know, in other words, you know, forgive them, but you want me to spend quality time with them now as well? That's actually the hardest. And so this story is amazing because every single aspect of forgiveness and its qualities are there. There's no loopholes in this story that we can get. And I think God has just decided to tell us that the real proof of love is when somebody hurts you, when somebody does something wrong to you, when somebody's faults that you shouldn't even be looking at get right in your way, and then you love them. That's proof that you have love. And really, you cannot learn to love until you can learn to forgive. Forgiveness is the door to love. Forgiveness is the gateway to love. Martin Luther King Jr. said, he who is devoid of the power to forgive is devoid of the power to love. And this is a remarkable statement from someone who comes from a background of oppression for hundreds of years. And yet he realized that forgiveness was the pathway to love. You can't not live with anyone in any kind of close relations that sooner or later you're not going to have to practice forgiveness. It's just the way it is. Not a husband, not a wife, not a child, not, not a relative, not a workmate, not a classmate. Sooner or later you have to practice it. So this is an essential quality and it's not one that I would have immediately included in my big six. But gradually as I read things and as I thought about it more I realized that one cannot learn to be like Abdu'l Baha if one cannot practice this quality. If they cannot go home from this school and try to at least forgive in their minds, if not in real life, everyone that they've hurt. And they will find that suddenly they have become freed, that they have become liberated and a huge chip has been carved away and they are closer to God's image. <laughs>